I'm often receiving messages from people reaching out for help and advice because they're feeling purposeless or directionless, are trying to change the world but it all feels futile, or they're suffering in their jobs, relationships, lives and want a way out. The details differ between people but the kernel is the same. So many people are finding themselves with a vague sense of spiritual, emotional or physical distress. I think they expect me to give them some sort of practical solutions, a blueprint to follow, but these days my go-to response is simply to say, have you tried doing absolutely nothing? They're usually incredulous, like, what do you mean do nothing? The world is on fire, my life sucks, I need to take action. And I totally get it, for years I've been indoctrinated into the virtue and necessity of constant productivity and have bought into the rallying cry, workers of the world unite, urging relentless struggle, that it feels self-indulgent, frivolous and unacceptable to rest. But as is often the case, when we fail to rest, sometimes the world makes us stop. I recently had a really painful breakup and an end to some really significant friendships and life as I knew it ground to a halt. And from that great pause, I gained a newfound clarity that maybe amidst this relentless doing, we've forgotten something just as vital, just as revolutionary. What if the most radical act we could undertake today is not only to unite, but also to rest? In the months preceding my breakup, I was constantly feeling lazy and lethargic. I kept getting sick. I had these extreme nightmares and the first thought I'd have when I woke up in the morning was this relationship isn't right for me. For a while my body was literally closing up, not allowing him to enter. The signals were always there that the relationship needed to end, but I was refusing to listen, avoiding those feelings via doing, doing, doing. I think this is true for most of us. In one way or another, there's information, our bodies, spirits, souls, the earth, our ancestors, dreams, whatever resonates with you, want to share with us. The subtle cues of our bodies that are alerting us. Our dreams where we can tap into a layer of our unconscious that can be instructive for life. Nature, this vast network of communicating intelligence that wants to draw us into silent dialogue to inform and guide us. Some of the greatest breakthroughs, inventions and pieces of art have come from people who recognised they were a conduit for some other source to flow through them. The ancient Greeks personified this as the muse. Certain martial art forms are said to have been transmitted from something transhuman. And musicians experience this same state when, to paraphrase the Grateful Dead, the music plays the band. But these days, so many of us have forgotten how to listen. And so to slow down and allow spaciousness, silence and interiority can help the portal to open, the antenna to link up, so we can receive transmissions. This isn't a call for passivity, of course there's time for urgency and action, but I take inspiration from the ancient Chinese concept of Wu Wei, translated as non-doing, but not in the sense of never doing anything at all. It refers to a deep level of connectedness with ourselves and the world. Instead of self-forcing, goading and guilting ourselves to take action, it's about trusting that we will do when it is time to do and not do when it is not time. The impulse to work in wiser ways than we can possibly imagine will arise when the time is right. Trisha Hersey, founder of the Knapp Ministry, wrote in Rest is Resistance, a manifesto. One of her biggest inspirations is abolitionist Harriet Tubman's escape from slavery via the Underground Railroad. 
Harriet didn't have a physical map, but she had an internal spiritual map. She would say she'd get a word from God on which way to go. And even though it was a life or death situation, the dogs were on her. If she were to get caught, she would die. Trisha likes to imagine the reason she was able to walk to freedom, taking hundreds of people with her, was because of her subversive and deep refusal to rush. She paused, listened and prayed. So what are the whispers we have silenced in our relentless productivity? What would we have learnt if we stopped to rest? To follow the feeling of aliveness, rightness, flow, the transmissions? Where would we be if we allowed ourselves to be a conduit for that which wanted to be born through us to manifest? In order to allow my antenna to open, I've been really trying to connect to my body and emotions and actually feel my feelings with this breakup. By truly listening, so many strange and interesting revelations have come to me. One of the most vivid moments was when I was feeling so afraid and I put my hand on my chest like this and I felt my little inner child taking me by the hand and taking me down this tunnel and she showed me my body being eaten by vultures and men. I talked a lot more about that and other experiences in my latest Patreon vlog, but what was interesting to me is that even though I already knew on an intellectual level that some of the choices I'd been making around men weren't the best, there was something about the visceral sensation of that visualization that really gave me this intense sense that I do not want to repeat these patterns in relationships anymore. It was a deeper embodied knowing rather than just an intellectual knowing. To me this is part of the power of rest. It allows us to feel on a visceral level the moments that touch our soul. And I can't help but feel that part of the reason we aren't getting anywhere on multiple fronts race, class, environmentally, is because we haven't had the capacity to feel any of it. White supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy's love of logic, reason and the mind over the heart, body and emotional supports our tendency to act as distanced spectators. It's much easier to watch, analyse and judge. Yeah, I know, people are dying and nature is becoming destroyed. But to really feel it in our bones and allow the heart to be part of the process is often what inspires action. Our next patron book club will be on Shay, A Revolutionary Life. And what's really been striking to me about Shay is how much his capacity for deep feeling was what cemented his commitment to revolution. If you tremble with indignation at any injustice, you are a comrade of mine. He calls the most beautiful quality in a revolutionary being guided by a great feeling of love. And his last words to his children in a goodbye letter read, Above all, always be capable of feeling deeply any injustice committed against anyone anywhere in the world. That being said, it's not just about our capacity to deeply feel injustice, it's also about deeply feeling beauty. The vision I had of my inner child wasn't all doom and gloom. I also felt this intense love for her and desire to protect and care for her. Author and needle worker Alice Starmore once said, it's hard to care for what you don't know. Always running from myself, I didn't much care what I was doing to myself or my inner child. I didn't know myself, let alone my inner child. In the same way, having cut ourselves off from knowing the world as ensouled and alive, from community and planetary solidarity, it's hard to really care. Author Dan Emmons writes, The problems we experience in our lives and in the world, whether relationship issues or world hunger, stem from the energetic weakness and disconnection from our lack of capacity to feel ourselves, each other, the earth, and how life seeks to move and evolve through us. The issue is not whether or not to act and do something, but what actually prompts us to act. 
that's why I think it's so important to cultivate the presence and stillness to deeply feel and know this world. When I really tune into the beauty of this one wild and precious life, humans all walking repositories of hidden treasures, the gurgling of streams, beautiful flowers, adorable little turtles, that I need the trees as much as I need my lungs, and the millions of cultures all across the globe, it truly blows my mind and ignites this fire in me to truly do all I can to make sure that they continue to thrive. So to rebel against a hectic busy life and rest in the passionate perception of life as both brutally painful and extraordinarily beautiful goes a long way to reducing the percepticide desensitization and dissociation so many of us have fallen into for most of our lives. I'm in a phase right now where I feel pretty lost. The future I envisioned with my partner, the life I thought we were building, the children we could have had, have all turned to dust. I live in Spain partially because he's Spanish and lives here. Now the relationship is over and my accommodation ends in a month. Do I stay? Do I go back home? I feel unmoored, like a boat adrift at sea. Anyone who has been in this place of feeling lost knows it's equally disorientating and exhilarating. My usual orientation in these situations is to jump straight to planning, doing, coming up with a blueprint for the future. That's true for most of us. When we're lost, we try to immediately fix it as if it's a problem. But when we act out of urgency, when we feel lost, either personally or collectively, we often end up with ridiculous solutioneering. Like in my case, immediately jumping into a new relationship and replicating the same harmful patterns. Or quick fixes to planetary problems where the underlying root causes remain unaddressed. It's like when you've lost your keys and you're urgently looking for them everywhere, then you finally take a moment to pause, breathe, and suddenly you remember where you put them. We tend to devalue these moments of pause, emptiness, reflection. How do you find your keys? It does help to look around and explore, but at some point we have to stop and introspect. Is there a pattern to my wanderings? What do I remember about how I created this loss? What is the key for anyway? As the novelist and poet Wendell Berry writes, It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work, and when we no longer know which way to go, we have begun our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. So for all that is unresolved in my heart right now, I'm starting to think maybe the best thing I could do is to surrender to the mystery and uncertainty. I like to think of it like a prayer. I hand my problem over to God, the universe, nature, whatever, <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, and just let go. Often in that empty space, the answers to my conundrums emerge unexpectedly, clear of its fog. I receive a true vision of the next step, the path forward, the new phase of life. I worry now that in our habits of calculating, planning, controlling, stuck in the rat race, following the linear trajectory of life, we don't allow ourselves to veer off track to go down a rabbit hole that is longer, messy and unknown, follow a whimsy or a hunch, ridiculous experimental divergent that from the outside might look like we're going off the rails, being lazy or unproductive, but within which lie infinite possibilities. I worry we have lost this capacity to get lost. I worry we never go beyond that which we know. During this breakup, I've often been confronted with my own hypocrisy. I like to preach anti-capitalism, and yet I'm holding myself to the standards of production on YouTube, akin to an evil capitalist overlord. 
I don't have time to grieve, rest, reflect, I tell myself. I need to feed the YouTube juggernaut. But how can I imagine a world without military police and surveillance if I keep policing, castigating and surveilling my own body and self? Isn't our urgent scurrying for ever more, never enough, what got us in this mess in the first place? Even if I achieved what I set out to, would I not just be replicating the same things I sought to dismantle? Would my message, no matter how beautifully articulated, not simply be lost on you? Because if I'm not embodying what I'm calling for, are they simply empty words? My favourite articulation of practising what we preach and living the message comes from the 20th century anarchist Emma Goldman in her autobiography. At the dances, I was one of the most untiring and gayest. One evening, a cousin of Sasha, Alexander Berkman, a young boy, took me aside. With a grave face, as if he were about to announce the death of a dear comrade, he whispered to me that it did not behoove an agitator to dance. Certainly not with such reckless abandon, anyway. It was undignified for one who was on the way to become a force in the anarchist movement. My frivolity would only hurt the cause. I grew furious at the impudent interference of the boy. I told him to mind his own business. I was tired of having the cause constantly thrown in my face. I did not believe that a cause which stood for a beautiful ideal, for anarchism, for release and freedom from conventions and prejudice, should demand the denial of life and joy. I insisted that our cause could not expect me to become a nun, and that the movement should not be turned into a cloister. If it meant that, I did not want it. I want freedom, the right to self-expression, everybody's right to beautiful, radiant things. Anarchism meant that to me. And I would live it, in spite of the whole world. Prisons, persecutions, everything. Yes, in spite of the condemnation of my own comrades, I would live my beautiful ideal. Movements of rest and joy are also much more effective to get other people on board with. The Dalai Lama was once asked, what is the most important quality in a spiritual teacher? His answer, cheerfulness. That cheerfulness is an invitation that says, it feels good to be here, wouldn't you like to come too? If we invite people not into a world of self-flagellation, self-sacrifice and hard work, but of aliveness, restfulness, music, dance, rituals, celebrations, it's much easier to say, it feels good here, wouldn't you like to come too? That's why I think it's so important to walk the walk, to fully inhabit and embody the world we seek to create, so that it's so irresistible people can't help but to join. And people often assume we can't live like that because nothing would get done, we need hard work to succeed. But friendships, dinners, celebrations, play, rest and all the human bodily rituals have formed the core of community and rituals in indigenous cultures for centuries. Is this just another case where the civilised West with our notions of progress clocks and scarcity based thinking knows better? Could it be that the solutions to our problems lie not in the modes of beings, norms and values that we, the West, are accustomed to? Is there perhaps something vital and indispensable that can be learnt from, as writer and educator Martin Prechtel puts it, recovering our indigenous soul? Environmentalist and spiritual writer Charles Eisenstein in The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible tells the story of a friend, Philippa Pimentel, a leader in the transition town, a movement that was failing and burnt out until they made a radical shift. They now only do work that brings them deep joy and that they feel connected to, and as soon as it starts feeling like work, they stop. But rather than becoming inefficient and ineffective, they now get more done than ever before. Philippa says, The group is much more cohesive. There is freedom in expressing our feelings without being on the spot or feeling that we are responsible for all the negative stuff. I feel that in a way, with the people near me and myself, it is much easier to give ourselves to what we do without fear, with true joy and with a feeling of belonging. Somehow I feel that the others around the group sense that, and a lot of situations are unblocked. If the group does not flow, things tend to get stuck at one point. Since then, we do much more, 
in a much more positive way. How much more of an abundant message would it be if we were to say to people, find what is joyful and sacred to you and put your life's energy at its service? Dare you to only do work that feels infused with love? Wouldn't you like to live into being the world you seek to create? Like all things, we live in the context of cycles. There's a time for generation and a time for restoration, a time for fruition, a time for dormancy. I feel like I'm currently in the dormancy, the resting phase, which is often the hardest phase to be in because in a system that condemns laziness and pushes us towards ever more output, it can be really difficult to accept this phase of the cycle. But just as in nature, if we force unnatural growth, plants will wither and die. In the same way, if we are too hasty to rush this stage of the cycle, all that could have emerged within it can become stagnant, depleted or blocked. This is where the line between doing and non-doing becomes blurred. Often what looks like doing nothing is the most generative state of all because it's doing the utterly vital work of healing, restoring and growing. As the writer Rebecca Solnit beautifully put it, Take refuge in the beautiful stillness in which everything is happening in all the ways that nothing is happening in busyness. Many of the most well-known philosophers, scientists, politicians, creatives and thinkers whose work is legendary understood the value of phases of rest and phases of work. Writer John Steinbeck said, A problem difficult at night is resolved in the morning after the committee of sleep has worked on it. An exasperated Einstein is said to have remarked, Why do I get my best ideas in the shower? And psychiatrist and psychotherapist Carl Jung spent many idle hours playing with Lego. Social and political generativity is a bit like the cycles of nature too. We assume change happens in cause and effect predictable ways. The effort we put in is what we get out, an instant return on investment. But sometimes revolutions spring up in a season, take over a patch of land, and then are gone when winter comes. Sometimes progress is mostly underground, invisible, seeming like nothing is happening at all. And only when it's developed strong roots do we see wild and explosive growth as if from nowhere. It's strong roots giving it lasting power. Other changes occur from wayward seeds blown elsewhere in the wind. So in order to create an abundant ecosystem for ourselves and our movements to thrive, I think it's really important that we trust in the cycles of life. There are seasons where we flourish and bear fruit. Then we approach a wintering phase. Given enough rest, time and love, we will grow again. So in the wake of my breakup and my rest revolution, I'm on a little quest to be the best steward I could possibly be to this vessel. I'm trying to carve out 30 minutes every evening just to lay down and do absolutely nothing. I got rid of all social media on my phone. I only go on them when I'm going to upload a video. I'm hanging out more with animals. I'm gardening. I'm allowing time for long, inefficient, happy idling, dawdling and puttering, reading fiction for the first time in years, playing music again, meditating, daydreaming and going into myself for hours on end. I'm dancing around as much as I can, playing sports with my friends, cooking, eating and cleaning without listening to anything trying not to plan too much for what work I need to do so I can allow time for mystery, curiosity and sacredness to emerge. I structure my weeks and days in tune with the rhythm of my menstrual cycle and my neurodivergent brain. I'm regularly checking in with myself. What does my body, mind, soul need right now? What would it look like if I were well rested? What whispers, signals and transmissions am I receiving? This is what's working for me, but there's no blueprint to follow. Your body and soul are yours and know the way. I would simply trust what is coming up for you. 
there's no rush to figure out rest. It shouldn't be another thing to put on the to-do list that you feel guilty about for not achieving. It may take a lifetime of trial and error and experimentation to figure out. And perhaps the path to rest isn't something we can set out to do intentionally. Maybe the way emerges unbidden in moments of spaciousness. And some of you may be thinking, I can't rest, I've got bills to pay, kids to feed, work to do. And whilst I don't want to minimise the blatant reality of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy in making rest incredibly difficult, I do take inspiration from the trickster archetype, which to me epitomises restfulness. Unlike the rigidity and seriousness of the martyr, the trickster says, you know what, I'm going to use my playfulness, ingenuity and creativity to find a way out of no way. I like to think of my life as a little trickstery. I'm housekeeping in Spain. I get free accommodation in exchange for taking care of the garden and home whilst the homeowners are away. It means I don't have to worry about bills to pay or a conventional job so I can reclaim my time to create videos and to do work that actually inspires me. I lack stability and security but I feel I've made a way out of no way to live my life on my own terms. Even when I had more conventional jobs, I felt like a trickster, unionising for more time off, doing kegel exercises in boring meetings, using work hours to do my own creative projects when there wasn't much to do. A trickster always finds a way. So whilst the historic call to arms may have been workers of the world unite, maybe it's time for a different revolution. A quieter, yet equally defiant battle cry, workers of the world, rest. I hope after this video you can take 10 minutes to simply sit and do nothing and just be and feel your feelings and listen to the voices within you. I hope you can take the coziest blanket you have, wrap it around you, take a nap, take a rest, go to sleep. And if you would like to, I would love to hear so much anything that came up for you whilst watching this video. What is your relationship to rest? What is your rest revolution? I want to sincerely thank my current patrons for making this channel possible and I'd really appreciate if anyone who enjoys this channel could consider becoming a patron. You can cancel at any time, there's absolutely no obligations, it's easy to set up. And in exchange we have a discord where we like to chat together. Every two weeks we either have a book club or a community call. And I also create monthly vlogs. Our next book club will be on Shay, A Revolutionary Life. The next community call will be on Reclaiming Radical Rest. And the latest patron vlogs were on my struggles with friendships, uh, my breakup and my other experiences with visualisations and tuning into the transmissions around me. You can also leave a one-time tip via Ko-fi or PayPal. And if you liked this video, you may like my video on reclaiming radical creativity. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. I hope you have a restful day. Bye.